now. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the second class of this year's MIT IAP Computational Law Workshop course. Before we get started today, Daz is going to be going over a couple of housekeeping items. So I'm going to pass over the floor to Daza. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Brian, if you'd be uh, kind enough to call up some of the class slides, that would be terrific. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I want to say that we had our, I'll just take care of some housekeeping things and a little bit of context setting. We had our first um, office hours last week on Tuesday, and I think it was successful. People seem to like it. Um, and uh, what we, the rhythm for those of you that weren't part of it is we basically went more deep into the substance of the topic. So, so people had some nice lines of questions and uh, we, we had an opportunity to discuss them. Uh, to, uh, in that vein, um, after our first speaker, uh, you'll be hearing from um, the co-teacher, the, the uh, TAs, uh, some lightning talks later today. And uh, they're going to go even deeper into different, what I think are seminal aspects of computational law. And we're going to use the office hours next week to really get into the dialogues. And so, um, so have a listen today, kind of try to digest what you hear. Uh, we'll send you the remarks later with some catalyzing questions and we can get into it more deeply in office hours. And we have the Telegram channel at long last up and running. And so thanks to everybody's heart, it took an entire village to really get that going. Uh, and so if you're in it, um, I encourage you to use that as a back channel. Uh, during class and to, you know, maybe even start grappling with some of these topics and of course our main speaker. Uh, and if you're not yet in it, um, we have a link um, that we have sent and I'll send out as part of the follow up where you can uh, request to join. Pro tip, uh, you need to make a Telegram username so that we can invite you into this um, kind of closed channel. And we have a link to that right in the form. Um, in the email I sent, I also gave a little bit of a, a deep preview to class number three, where we've got a couple of great uh, speakers, Senator uh, Chris Rothfuss, uh, who's gonna talk about, I think, groundbreaking digital identity legislation that some of us have been involved in here, Bre Brendan Marr, uh, TMA, uh, myself and others. Uh, and uh, we've got links to some of that. And, uh, and um, also, we'll hear from New America Foundation on, on the, the essence of property ownership in the digital age. Um, so it's not too early to start taking a peek at some of that stuff. But our main course today um, is standards, and that underlies so much of computational law. Um, and so without further ado, uh, I'd like to hand it back to our erstwhile um, um, MC TMA to uh, set up our first speaker, uh, my friend and colleague Ken Jones. So, TMA, take it away, please. Thanks, um, Brian. Would you mind moving this slide over to Ken's page? Great, awesome. So today, like Dad has said, we'll be joined by Kenneth Jones. Next page. Next page. Yeah. Mr. Jones is a chief technologist at Tandenbaum Kill LLP where he oversees various aspects of technology at his firm in his role as CIO. He leads efforts to support TK's computing environment and infrastructure to ensure that client data in the cloud is processed and protected with highly skilled and respected leading edge business partners in the technology space. Mr. Jones also leads and supports various TK programs in the areas of security, compliance, business continuity, and firm administration. Okay, Ken, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Tammy and Daza. It's a true pleasure to be here. And it would be fine to move the slides forward into the agenda for today. Um, and so as, as Daza indicated, the area of standards is, is a vitally important area. It lends itself to interoperability, communication between companies, and a whole host of other benefits. And I will do my utmost to, to try to convey some elements of information and, and wisdom as it relates to this. Um, you know, I, the first thing I wanted to say is that, you know, everything in life 
can be a learning experience. As, as Daza has pointed out, a good element of my job is, is one serving as the CIO of, of a law firm. Um, standards and, and things like that are, are very interesting, but there's an element of my job that relates to help desk tickets and broken computers and cloud platform technology and, and everything in between. So just to, in preparing for this opportunity to, to speak on this topic, you know, it, it, it encouraged me to speak with many experts, to do independent research, and I myself benefited from it. And so it's been very beneficial for me. And I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, as it pertains to my professional life, just to introduce myself, uh, Desa made the same point I was going to make. I have a very practical job. You know, I'm just a, a simple chief technologist from a law firm with three offices here in the United States. Um, you know, Tannenbaum Kiel is a litigation boutique, a full service firm serving primarily Fortune 500 companies. Um, you know, today we'll be discussing many theoretical topics, topics that are also practical and in, in practice, but other things that are more forward thinking and, and my anticipation and as and many others of, of the industry that we are all working with and, and studying. But, you know, I think it's important to note that a, a, a balance between practical work and theoretical work is, is something we all have in our lives. It, it's, it's what makes life interesting and it's, you know, what, you know, um, makes us valuable in the marketplace. So today um, we'll talk about some standards in, in business in general. We'll then shift into legal standards and talk about the history of legal standards in the marketplace. We'll talk a little bit about technology fragmentation in legal. And, and finally, we'll, we'll summarize many of the current and emerging legal standards. So we can go forward, thank you very much. Um, and we'll talk to begin with um, all about standards in industry. I've worked in the legal field for 18 years. Before that, I worked uh, for a big pharma company, Bristol Myers Squibb for 13 years, pretty much my only two jobs. Um, and at Bristol, at the time, they were a large consumer products and pharma company, you know, something like Procter and Gamble and or J and J or you know and so forth. And so, as we sold to large customers like like drug retailers like McKesson, uh, companies like Walmart, some others that aren't in business anymore, there was a tremendous needs for standards to just handle day to day business like taking an order or making a shipment or invoicing, you know, the kinds of things that we all see and do when we say shop online with Amazon or, or any other vendor. Um, and, and back then, um, some standards bureaus emerged. We had the American National Standards Institute, um, which was primarily you know, uh, an American thing. Uh, the United Nations had something similar called Edifact, which was primarily European, not exclusively. Um, and business and enterprise had tremendous gains because instead of building one interface between companies, all of your customers for orders, um, we, we had a common one. You know, you could reuse work, you could follow best practices. These standards were set by, you know, organizations, not by say a, a leading market leader, like say Microsoft might set conventions for Outlook, not that they do it poorly, but you know, but you know, it, it's still maybe better when you have a cross-functional team doing that. And, and so I, I learned early in my career in the 90s, um, some of the values of, of standards in, in the world. Um, Daza, I think maybe you might want to make a, a brief additional comment in this area. Um, you know, I, you know I, I do have some comments, but um, I think my, I'm liking the flow of the talk, so I, I don't want to interrupt okay. it, if you fair, don't mind. Fair enough. Thanks. Sure, sure, fair enough. So, um, you know, be it understood that, you know, standards have tremendous value in industry and we'll now shift gears, roll to the next slide and begin to focus and hone in a little bit more on, on our industry, on, on the legal industry. So again, this slide is meant to talk about the past. Uh, the past can be boring, but we can also learn from the past and from history. So there are really two primary standards or communication interchanges. They're, they're not confused, but 
used interchangeably, even though they're not really interchangeable. But there are uniform task-based management system task codes. And then there's this LEADS standard, the Legal Electronic Data Exchange Stand, which sends data around from point A to point B. Essentially what that is in, in practice is as timekeepers, attorneys, you know, or, or paralegals, legal assistants work on tasks for clients, they will enter their time into a system. I spent two hours working on a legal brief. I spent an hour doing research. I, I, I spent all day in a trial, you know, and, and so forth. And, and that data is, is entered into time and billing systems and transmitted to our, to our clients. And so the test codes were designed by the ABA. Um, the most common ones are something called a litigation test code set, which is there's five series, five phases, things like, you know, discovery, research, free trial, trial, and appellate. Um, and those codes are used to generate time entries, which generate invoices, which are transmitted to clients to generate payments. Um, and, you know, these standards, which were also made with, uh, you know, with the assistance of PricewaterhouseCoopers, they're, they're widely used. You know, this is the number one way that today law firms bill for time. And despite some weaknesses that we'll discuss later, it's still one of the ways that law firms are compared and contrasted with, with others in terms of how efficient we might be, who handles like matters better. Um, to a certain extent, it, there's efforts to try to use them for budgeting and very, you know, other, other types of, of processes in the legal field. Um, so the, the key takeaway here is that there is at least one common standard in legal, it's, it is leads and, and the test codes, and it's used extensively for billing, but in other areas, there are fewer, um, you know, standards in place. Now, to what extent is that important? And, and this is a, a little bit of, of a shift um, in, in focus, but it's important to sort of set the scene and, and properly analyze the situation. Um, you know, the, the legal technology industry is fairly fragmented. Um, to compare and contrast it to other areas, you know, almost all of us, not all of us, but almost all of us would use Office 365, you know, for email and, Excel and Word and PowerPoint and so forth. That's that's very consolidated, very standardized. Um, in the corporate world, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning, or or CRM systems, uh, customer relationship management, they're moderately consolidated. Um, Salesforce, for example, is a customer relationship management system that has a pretty good foothold in the marketplace. We've all heard of them. They're a common company, you know. It's, it's fairly common when a salesperson for a Fortune 500 company might go out to make a call and transmit information back to their company that they're using Salesforce. Um, SAP is a large enterprise resource planning ERP system. It's, it's fairly common that SAP or something like Oracle Financials could be used in, in large institutional clients to handle many functions of, of an organization. Um, Example would be companies with say order to cash initiatives. This means everything from taking an order to getting a payment would be handled in a single system. Um, you know, other opportunities for this might be companies that have a single chart of accounts. Uh, you know, that's, that's your general ledger, you know, and, and having one of those throughout a large institutional company, well, it makes all the sense in the world, but in practice that it, it, it used to be at least quite rare. And, and, and now it's increasingly common. So, you know, the legal industry tends to, however, have different players in different verticals. You know, companies that do practice management or matter management or document management systems, DMS or time and billing, for the most part are different companies. You know, I manage in net documents might be in the DMS space, they are in a DMS space, but they're not really in, in many other spaces. Uh, and so this presents issues, you know, and one of the biggest one is how do you get data back and forth between these systems? Now, going back to 10 minutes ago, you know, EDI standards with orders and, and financial information and shipments and so forth made that much easier in, in general industry. It's still a big challenge in legal. And so when you begin to factor in looking at the, at the final 
bullet, the fact that we have entities like Renyan Court, which is a containerized way to deploy applications and something that's being advocated fairly strongly by the largest law firms in the world, like Amlaw 50 or 100. And, and that's a technology where you can render applications to, to groups in a, in a private cloud, which is you know, desirous for the types of firms that work on like M&A and financial information. It's, it's exceptionally high security. But, but you know, then you have public cloud entities like, like I manage in the cloud or, or Salesforce is something like that. Um, and lots of different approaches over and on top platforms, maybe better way of putting it over and on top of different companies. So it just offers the legal tech industry a, a lot of op consensus opportunities, opportunities to consolidate. But until that happens, standards and, and ways that these companies can, you know, interact together in a in a common manner is is exceptionally valuable, even more valuable perhaps than in the rest of the technology world. So let us now dive into the material and I apologize for taking so long to get here. Um, there's a entity known as the Sally Alliance and it is generating not-for-profit legal industry standards. This is a very, very, very valuable group, a group that's doing great work and, and why is that, you know? So one reason is they're working towards a standard called the Legal Matter Standard Specification, LMSS. And they, they have two versions out. Uh, you know, the second one is, is, is fairly new, but this is designed to be a standard that allows every system to use common metadata to classify data, uh, to uh, classify matters, excuse me, or to more importantly, or maybe as importantly, to classify common work tasks. It's, you know, the process of taking a deposition or, you know, uh, attending a court conference or, or any other legal work task, it's very hard to budget for, it's very hard to price, it's, it's very hard to do anything with if you don't have a common understanding of what that is. And, and one of the biggest challenges of that is that it's totally different in different practice areas. A deposition for a product's liability litigation matter was very different from one maybe in family court or, or any banking or lots of other different areas. So one of the core things LMSS looks to do, um, and I, I spoke with, and they were very gracious with the time, Peter Buck from, from NetDocuments and, and Toby Brown from Perkins Coie, is, is they look to classify um, legal work. You know, so if you have a document in a system, you would use this specification to understand that it's, it's, it's an IP document, it's a litigation document, it's a banking document, it's a merger and acquisition document and so forth. And, you know, prior to these standards, everybody had their own way of doing it. Um, it probably worked for most people, but virtually impossible to communicate those across systems and, you know, across different entities, like law firm to client, you know, and, you know, corporate legal department to law firm and, and so forth like that. So, you know, a lot of great work being done there. And, and one of the reasons it's, it's really good, bouncing back to a couple slides ago, not that we need to do that, but just to relate back to it, is that the LEADS standards and the, the task codes were built primarily by the ABA and by PricewaterhouseCoopers. So, it, it, and, and, and the people did a great job, I'm not being critical, but it was created by lawyers, you know, and with that, with their perspective on, on the issue, whereas Sally is a broader consortium. They have folks from the courts, they have you know, um, legal operations specialists, they have clients, they have law firms. They work very, very hard to get a broad representation of stakeholders who can all hash out issues. It, it tends to, I think, probably make progress a little bit more slower and laborious, but at the end of the day, it, it cranks out better work product. So it, it really does offer a great promise because of their, their methodology and their structure. They receive funding from all kinds of groups. One of them is say the ILTA, the International Legal Technology Association, you know, so they can remain you know, standard agnostic and, and do what they truly believe is, is best for the industry. So their vision to date, you know, and, and I'm, I'm no expert, like I said, I'm a, I'm a practitioner more than a, a, you know, a, a deep thinker, but 
they, they've done a lot of work on legal matters specifications. They're, they're looking into billing definitions. They're looking into the other types of litigation. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, the hope is that these various taxonomies lead to common understanding of, of tasks and activities. And, you know, before we leave this slide, I mean, that's, that's really important because as you try to price or budget matters, unless you have that common understanding, it's, it's very difficult to do it. You know, somebody thinks you're doing something that takes a half an hour, other people think that task might take two days. And that, that sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's not untrue. You know, um, there's a really good piece by Jay Um on legal evolution this whole week, and she's a pricing expert um, with a law firm. And, you know, I, I'd recommend checking that out. She has a lot of good ideas, but a lot of the things in the pricing area that, that folks are working on are, you know, not really possible without these types of standards in place. So let's briefly talk about some other legal tech trends. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. First of all, it's incredibly broad. We have a very short period of time and, 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 and DAS is organized for all of you, the links to the standards, which anyone can delve into in, in more detail. Um, but you know, Oasis Open, is you know um, a place where they're working on contract standards, everything from maintaining contracts, you know, updating them, transmitting them, and so forth and so on. You know, um, and that relies on on some XML standards, and you know, that transitions us to the next phase of modern technologies. Some of this is done in XML. Many of us consider that to be, you know, yesterday's technology with JSON being today and tomorrow's. Uh, again, that all depends on, on, on where you sit. You know, I, as a practitioner, still have certain interfaces that, that might be in even older technologies. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, uh, but clearly the, the way the world is REST APIs, you know, we're writing some systems that we, we provide to our clients, you know, in things like Node.js and, and jQuery and, and JSON and so forth. Um, and so that's, that's the way the world, moving things to a, a client side sort of world. Um, just one, one, one ahead, notable um, uh, context on Oasis, which is not well known outside of small standard setting circles, but um, uh, they also uh, were the lead in the late 90s. And I remember working on this a lot in, for court filings. So anytime you can submit, you know, like a matter before a court uh, in the US, there was a Every, every jurisdiction basically had its own way to do it. It was very idiosyncratic or they just use FTP. Now there's, there's a wide um, adoption of these court filing standards so we can capture the metadata and you know vendors can build systems that work across a bunch of courts. They also have um, the uh, ACOMA uh, legislative uh, markup for um, legislation. And uh, they were you know, kind of partway through uh, a better notarization standard. I wish that that had finished in time for the pandemic, but they've got a nice little cluster of uh, legal standards. Most of it's business standards in Oasis, but I think it's notable uh, if you poke around there that there's a, a, a small but thriving uh, legal standards community. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll, I'll br close briefly on this, but, you know, SEC and Edgar have made similar headway with financial filings. And cues and, and so forth. And so more and more, um, these standards are, are entering our industry and more and more people see the common value of them, you know, so that, you know, we can build things once and, and, and leverage it many times, which is a far more efficient way of working. Okay, so I think I kind of went on and on about Sally when I spoke about them, but just to add a few extra words, you know, it, it's, it's a standard setting project. It's a broad consortium of members from a very large cross section of industry. And just one quick example, as I, you know, as I did research for this talk, I spoke to some folks from that documents and, and they talk about how they apply the Sally standard to documents in their systems so they have a, a great and better understanding of the type of work and expertise that they have. Um, this, this has a lot of value to them as they look to onboard new customers, talk about where their strengths and weaknesses might be and so forth. Um, another example in industry is like we briefly talked about, you know, um, looking at things like tasks 
um, and and applying standards to them. So we're not talking about apples and apples. You know, if I say I have to, you know, give give this talk today, there should be some sort of code or standard that helps people understand. I'll be spending an hour or so doing it. You know, not 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 a week. You know, but um, you know, that's all those things are important. And and they're beginning to expand into other working groups, other countries. There's a Canadian working group. So a lot of great work going on there. And I highly recommend um, that you, you check them out and, and see what they're doing because I think it'll become more and more important in the industry. And, and finally, I'm going to close with a very brief talk about how standards could be beneficial in, in a lot of what I do. Um, we have a, a software company called Zerdict. We have a product called Case Ensemble. It's a legal matter management product. We're not big. We, we supply it primarily to our legal clients and to a few others. Um, but as we work, leveraging standards is really, really helpful. Um, there's so much open source material out there in, in JSON, XML, and different technologies. Um, a lot of it's stored in, in GitHub. If I remember correctly, your course materials are stored in GitHub. So you should all be familiar with that, but it's an awesome place for, for source code management, checkout and so forth. Um, so, you know, another good thing to learn about. But again, you know, it just, and it just a closing comment is whether it's business 30 years ago with, you know, order to cash and things like that, or the types of things we're studying in computational law and legal, or if it's in application development or software development, standards are a very important thing to be mindful of. They, they provide great value. They help you work more intelligently, more productively, and at a higher quality. And you know, always, always keep those in mind to try to be sure that your work is consistent with other practitioners in your industry. Um, so, so with that, uh, Dazza, or uh, I think I've, I've made it through my slides at least semi-successfully. Um, I know we have an appendix with some links and um, I'm happy to engage in, in further dialogue via questions or any other way. Thanks, thanks so much, Ken. That, that was perfect. And I appreciate uh, all the diligence you, you exhibited in putting the slides together and actually conducting some interviews to get up to speed on uh, Sally and other things. So, you know, for all the guest speakers that are watching this and who are going to present later, look to Ken as your role model for how to do this. Um, and uh, I think just by way of um, maybe seeding a little bit of the, of your, of the thinking for the students uh, to, for posing questions in, in the big scheme of things, you know, law and standards, you know, they're largely not related. I mean, most standards are technical engineering, you know, um, science, uh, but, you know, number one law applies to standards. Um, very much so. A lot of the standards makings, people wrangle over the copyright and patentability, liability, and there's a, a whole industry uh, that you can find out more about at consortium.org and Andy Updegrove site that I, I link to in the chat. But more, even more on point for computational law, there's law that applies standards. So almost all the law related to weights and measures, uh, you know, like how do you know how much is a gallon uh, at a uh, uh, when you're filling up your uh, tank for fuel, that's heavily regulated and they uh, incorporate by reference, you know, like test ban treaty, uh, nuclear test ban treaty incorporates by reference, very particular seismic readings, uh, you know, building codes are incorporated by reference. We mentioned XBRL, extensible business rep, uh, reporting language is a, a dialect of XML that's standardized. It's incorporated by reference in the SEC's regulations. Uh, also, there's legal technology standards, which is really, I think, the the focus of, of Ken's talk with Sally and billing codes and the e-contracts. Uh, and then there's standards for law itself, um, which we foreshadowed a little bit. That's when the standards are not, uh, are, are for law. So U.S. markup language is what the U.S. Congress uses to mark up um, the, all of legislation. We talked about a coma is an international standard for that. Uh, I mentioned the court filing standards. And so this sort of crops up. There's many dimensions of, um, of relevance for standards. And standards are so very important, just not only to benefit from the thinking of people about how to engineer a system and how to make sure it's fit for purpose, but also, as Ken was kind of foreshadowing a couple of times in the talk, for interoperability. 
So it's one thing if you're building a one-off system that you're the only person or a small team that will use, you, know, you can be a lot more idiosyncratic there, I think, with your code. But if you want to deploy something broadly, if you want it to be adopted across a market or an industry, and most particularly if you want it to be able to interconnect with other software, uh, these standards can be absolutely essential. And, uh, and we're still lagging behind in the law with standards adoption. And that's a uh, part of, I think, a reflection of the law lagging behind other industries uh, with the um, uptake and the absorption of technology. So there's a, a couple of um, provocative, maybe partly uh, framing things to maybe uh, catalyze some questions. So um, do we uh, do we have any um, questions that anyone's uh, noted um, that you would that we should pose to Ken? Yeah, we can go off in order if that works. What, what do we have, TMA? So we have from Philippe. Um, in a nutshell, can anyone explain why JSON is better than XML and other formats, for example? OK, I, I, I'll start on that one. But I'd love to hear from others as well, especially people who have really worked with this stuff. Um, so first of all, the word better is super loaded. Um, and so you know, it's really like, what is fit to purpose? Um, I generally find JSON way better for almost everything I ever do with technology. And XML almost never comes up. Uh, but XML, if you're doing a, a markdown of a document with a document structure, XML is really good for that. Um, the uh, the S XML is itself a sub part of a broader standard called SGML, uh, which has a lot richer functionality and you can go much deeper. Um, so that's great if you're marking up documents uh, or if you're dealing with a legacy system that does things with XML, terrific. There's also some XML in other parts of technology. Sometimes it's used for meta, meta information, you know, um, encapsulating other data. The thing that's great about JSON, I think, um, is that uh, number one, it, it lets us become more data centered and less document centered. Um, that's very, very important when you're having dynamically generated information or when you want to break things down to smaller modular pieces, when you want to do analytics, that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's a struggle to turn something from XML to you know, traverse the schema, as it were, um, and to turn that into something that's either tabularized or object oriented or that you could is suitable to put into a database or, or something where you can start to do analytics or anything with it. It's like really hard. JSON, it's like uh, hot butter. It's super easy. The other thing is that it's uh, if you're using a REST API application programming interface, and that is the that's the lingua franca of the web, they all are native JSON. Um, so like that's how the data is structured um, and, ser and you know, serialized. Uh, yeah, and, and so Daza, that, that, that's a good time for me to jump in because right. that was going to be my, my point, which I'm going to just keep very general, but look, JSON is, is part of REST API and part of you know, 2.0 technologies more, even more broadly. And you know, one of the huge elements of value we see in moving from server side to client side technology as we redo our systems is just reducing calls back to databases, processing more data in, in browsers, um, and, and being far more efficient in how we render information to, to our customers, to our clients. You know, a lot of legal has tremendous amounts of data, maybe not data per se, but large document sets associated with, with um, cases and so forth. And so the more time you can process without going back and forth to servers, the better response time, the better service, the better you know, um, acceptance level you'll have with your users in terms of, of how things work and so forth. So JSON is kind of just packaged with a lot of other things you know, within REST API and it's kind of, it is just the way to go. And I know that's not a technical statement, but it's the way to go as you're rebuilding and building systems in the future. You're here. And just a, a quick um, program note, um, we have a heavyweight uh, with technology and standards in with us today. Uh, Brian Ulysny, who, who uh, um, really um, did great work with um, Thomson Reuters Labs in Boston and so much other great work, uh, is saying to everybody, almost like a safety note, um, SGML is way harder to deal with than XML. Don't go back. Yeah, I agree. Don't go back to SGML. It's just notable that it's there. Uh, and it does more. Um, so uh, do we have time for one more question, Ken? I know you got to run soon. No, no, I have time. Sure, go ahead. Okay. 
Okay, Which, so Valeria asked, talking with lawyers in your job, did you consider if there are any areas of law that are easier or harder to adapt and transpose in these standards? If yes, which ones are they? Okay, so, I mean, certainly. I mean, depending on who you're speaking with and what type of, of practice you're working with, um, things can be easier or harder. Uh, as an example, lawyers who are working on contracts and agreements for the most part are quite used to standards. Many of the ones that we've talked about in this presentation, um, lawyers who work more on M&A and financial work and with other business professionals who may be more technology astute than others um, and or, or with those who work with the largest companies in the world are probably, again, more apt to adopt standards and so forth. Um, you know, conversely, you know, maybe lawyers who, I don't know, work on research or trial matters or, you know, other types of work that are more narrative and, and you know, qualitative rather than quantitative might be less likely to even understand, you know, <laughs> the standards is there's probably lots of folks in the world who have problems digesting standards like this. Um, so it's, it's not something you can answer very easily, but, but sure. I mean, different classes of folks are more or less adaptive to all technologies, standards included. Awesome. So uh, Ken, I wanna thank you so much for the, for the talk. If people have uh, more questions, um, you know, pop them through our questions form, which we'll send a link to. Um, and, uh, and, um, and you're welcome in this class any time, Ken, you ever want to pop in. Um, just thank you again so much for your, your time and your diligence and, and for the excellent content that you shared. Well, it was, it was a pleasure to be here. And like I said, it was a great learning experience for me. And I, I apologize for having to leave early, um, but I certainly will participate in the future and, and wish you and everybody all the best. Have a, have a great day, everyone. Great, thanks so much. And so I am going to take the liberty of handing it to Brian Wilson, um, who's going to set up a really fascinating part of this class that I'm so excited about. Um, so put your seatbelts on everybody and prepare to be, I'm just gonna say blown away by some talks that I, I just thought were seminal for computational law. I know I'm, I'm ruining the expectations game here. You're supposed to set them low. I'm just setting them accurately. So Brian, why don't you why don't you uh, set it up for us, and uh, and then afterwards we'll we'll seek uh, like maybe one question for each uh, for each of these talks. Hit it. Sure thing. So coming up next, we're going to do something that we haven't really tried before in this course, and that is this idea of lightning talks. So we're going to hear from uh, the three TAs, Andrew, Megan, and TMA, on some topics that they've been doing research into. They'll give about a three to five minute presentation. We'll take one question. So please uh, kind of be adding those into the chat uh, chat on Zoom. And then uh, we'll kind of go into a bit of wrap up. Um, so first off, we have the legislative recipe, syntax for machine readable legislation. Take it away, Megan. All right, thank you very much, Brian. The prospect of machine readable legislation is both terrifying and thrilling. This renewed popularity is owed to the Rules as Code initiative. The fervor around Rules as Code was accelerated by the recent OECD Observatory of Public Sector Innovation Report titled, Cracking the Code. This report articulates how machine consumable, defined as machines understanding and actioning rules consistently, reduces the need for individual interpretation and translation and helps ensure the implementation better matches the original intent. This methodology enables the government to produce logic expressed as a conceptual model, in effect, a blueprint of the legislation. So what is the attraction and what are its limits? I frequently turn to this example. Lehman E. Allen lamented about ambiguity in legal drafting owed to syntactic uncertainties. In a fascinating study, he deconstructs an American patent statute and notices immediately the complexity with the word unless. He asks whether the inclusion of unless asserts a unidirectional or a bidirectional condition. That is, does the clause mean A, if not X, then Y, 
or B, if not X, then Y, and if X, then not Y. Though nuanced, Allen exposes an ambiguity that muddies the legal force of the statute. An interpretation of unless as a bi-directional condition raises the question of what not Y would mean. In this particular case, this could affect whether exceptions are possible in determining patent eligibility. In short for Allen, legislative language must have a clear structure. These ideas are not new. The ancestry dates back to 12th century logicians reflecting on the use of mathematically precise forms of writing. In the mid 1930s, German philosopher Rudolf Carnap reflected on a logical syntax of language. His argument is that logic may be revealed through the syntactic structure of sentences. He suggests that the imperfections of natural language point instead to an artificially constructed symbolic language to enable increased precision. Simply put, it is treating language as a calculus. More recently, Stephen Wolfram made a similar argument. Simplification, he states, could occur through the formulation of a symbolic discourse language. That is, if the poetry of natural language could be crushed out, one could arrive at legal language that is entirely precise. Machine readability appears then to bridge the desire for precision with the inherent logic and ruleness of specific aspects of the law. In other words, a potential recipe to resolve the complexity of legalese. However, if a new symbolic language like code effectively enforces a controlled grammar, what are its implications as it moves across the legal ecosystem? In particular, its interactions between various legal texts. Machine readable legislation may therefore be regarded as a product that evolved out of the relationship between syntax, structure, and interpretation. But at the core, it boils down to one question. What should be the role of machine readable legislation? Is it simply a coded version of legislation, one possible interpretation? Or is it a parallel draft of the legislation, one that has legal authority? Or is it a domain model of regulation from which third parties derive versions, such as an open source code, to say? These three scenarios, and of course not exclusive to the three, have their own sets of implications. And only in answering this question would a fruitful assessment of how logic syntax and symbolic language found in machine-readable legislation are capable of representing legal knowledge. Thank you. Very good. Does anybody have any questions that we might go to? And if there aren't any, I might speed one. Um, so Leonardo has a question. Um, hermeneutics is considered a technique of interpreting text, legal text for our matters, while at the same time creating it. And this concept, concept is very important in many jurisdictions, um, including Brazil, US, and others in which there's so-called this notion of judge-made law. How do you reconcile the kind of like ambiguity of judge-made law with uh, machine-readable legislation? Mm -hmm. So this is a really fascinating question. One of the sort of things that I point to when I say, what is sort of, what would happen if you have machine-readable legislation sort of interact with other legal texts? For example, if it's related to how it affects sort of contracts and in a, in a way how it affects judicial opinions. It's much to do with the conversation around it. And so I point back your question to which version of machine readable legislation are you considering here? Um, is it that it's just one variation? So when I talk about the one possible interpretation, because if it's just one possible interpretation, then it means that you can still often refer to a natural language variation of it. And that's where that dialogue between sort of judge made law or you know, judicial opinions can interact with the legislation, very similar to what's happening now and there's no change. But if, it, if the machine readable legislation does have legal authority, then the question is different, right? Um, what would the court regard as the one that should take precedent? Should it be the coded version or should it be the natural language version? And so your question is sort of, what do you think? Again, I'm turning it back to you. What do you think the role of machine readable legislation is? Because its implications again are dependent on kind of these various ways to see machine readable legislation. 
Here, here. There's even an article that I would encourage people to check out called Transactional Scripts and Contract Stacks by Dave Hoffman and Shane and Coney that kind of touches on some of these ideas. Um, so um, with that, we'll send around some more responses to these questions and then we'll get, and now we'll get to Andrew Dimzowski, who's going to talk to you all about the law of automated and autonomous legal entities. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, my lightning round discussion focuses on the laws of automated and autonomous legal entities. Some in this class, especially those with a blockchain background, may be familiar with the concept of a decentralized autonomous organization. My discussion will take as a thought exercise a legal entity that goes one step further than a DAO, an automated autonomous organization. This would be akin to a program which conducts legally significant affairs on its own. The overarching question here is, how would the law treat such an organization? What would the standard be for automated entities? I think that question can be split into two parts. First, how would the law treat liability stemming from an automated entity? And second, would that entity have legal personhood? We can take the classic example of an autonomous car injuring a pedestrian. What entity or entities has tort liability for those injuries? The manufacturer, the driver, the AI? Is there any criminal liability to assign? Can an AI have criminal intent? And what would you do with it if it did? How do you place an AI in jail? Broadly, the literature has considered many different potential liability frameworks for AI, including strict liability, agency law, or products liability or inventing a new framework entirely, perhaps a jurisdiction. In his article, How to Sue a Robot, Roger Mikalski coined the term in robotum for this purpose, a jurisdiction specific for artificial intelligences. As it relates to the second question on personhood, over the years, the law has assigned different legal statuses for many non-adult human persons, children, animals, wild animals, corporate persons, even bodies of water such as rivers have acquired legal standing in certain circumstances. What standing should an autonomous organization have? Should AI have intellectual property rights over its inventions or works? Should it have the authority to conduct business as any ordinary LLC? Or should we fashion a new legal status specifically for autonomous entities? These are difficult fact-specific questions However, the legal literature has provided several concepts that I have bundled together into what I call a working proposal. First, treat autonomous entities as an agent under agency law. This principle, the principle is a human creator, controller, or owner who defines the AI's scope of authority into a registry of some kind. If anyone is familiar with the concept of a robot.txt file, this could be akin to the AI registry. The AI is permitted to act within its scope of authority, but should it ever leave that scope, strict liability would apply. But strict liability against whom? Many scholars commenting on the ramifications of autonomous weapon systems have articulated the phrase meaningful human control. That is, those with meaningful human control over the AI could be responsible in a strict liability framework. This would satisfy a social demand for AI responsibility and avoid a potential accountability gap that could occur. Consider the scenario of an autonomous car injuring a pedestrian with no human person being held legally responsible. It is still very early in the evolution of the regulation of autonomous entities, but it is a critical discussion to have as it may become very relevant sooner than many think. So what would be your proposal? How should we apportion liability stemming from the actions of artificial entities? What should the legal standing be of AI? And perhaps most importantly, what implications would our treatment of AI have on the future of law and technology? Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, because of the time constraint and because it might be easier to respond to some of these questions a little bit asynchronously, I would actually encourage people moving forward to ask their questions in the Telegram class chat so that we can be sure that we get through all of the uh, all of the speaking and all of the instruction for this class. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to TMA who's gonna discuss uh, a topic called the algorithmic sentencing. Thanks, Brian. Hi everyone. 
Today, I'll be talking to you about the future role of algorithmic sentencing and human judges. Recently, as countries like Estonia and Singapore have started experimenting with algorithmic sentencing in their small claims courts, it's become more important than ever before to think about shifts that algorithmic sentencing may impose on existing judicial processes, particularly the trust and standards that apply to the role of the judge. Because the specifics of justice systems around the world vary so much, for the sake of simplicity, we'll keep this discussion to the US justice system. In the US, it's currently pretty well established that our justice system is riddled with ingrained biases and inequities. People of color are not only overrepresented as defendants in our criminal justice system, but they also receive longer sentences than their white defendants. And these injustices seem to be the byproduct of human biases and prejudices in sentencing by judges, which algorithms could certainly avoid. Many judges today would concede that a mere spreadsheet providing data on past sentencing decisions could help them make more objective decisions. So in this vein, it seems like carefully coded sentencing programs could skirt situations like when an Ohio judge went against the recommendation of both the defense counsel and the state prosecutor to condemn a 55-year-old woman who was a first-time nonviolent offender to 65 years in prison for petty theft. Or when a man condemned to a life sentence was condemned to a life sentence for merely attempting to steal a set of head shears. It's true that a non-trivial objection to algorithmic sentencing is that data used to program the code is often incomplete and incorrect, which biases outcomes. But assuming this can be remedied, we must ask if society would even be amenable to algorithmic justice. In the United States, judges are expected to be arbiters of justice. The code of conduct for the United States judges states as a very first canon that a judge should uphold the integrity and the independence of the judiciary. Further, they should not only maintain and enforce high standards of conduct, but they should personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be preserved. Would robot judges be able to personally observe anything and in turn fulfill the standard? Under the social contract theory, the concept of justice exists because of collectively negotiated human belief. Does the US justice system work in part because Americans believe in the idea of human judges as arbiters of justice? Or is it unnecessary? It's clear that the advent of algorithmic sentencing is calling into question the role of human judges as referees of justice. So in light of some of these considerations we went over today, I invite everyone to think about the pros and cons of both human judges and algorithmic sentencing and what you think the best path forward should be. Thank you. Thank you so much, TMA. I think this is one of those topics that becomes increasingly interesting because of how much it uh, is going to affect everything moving forward. Um, because the tools of today, or the tools of the future, or the outcomes of the future look a lot like they're going to depend on the tools of today. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Daza to preview the next course, and then we'll get into some ways to get involved and wrap up. Okay, that sounds good. Let me just triple check. Uh, do we not have time for one quick question for Andrew and TMA at this point? I mean, I, I think I can I can be super concise with my wrap up, but it would be good if we could give them each a shot. I, I've got a hard stop in five minutes. And so I can't uh, go through the ways to get involved if we do the, the questions. And I, so it's up to it's up to you. Okay, uh, I, I have the same hard stop for the next meeting as you do. Um, so I, uh, I'll take responsibility to say what needs to be said. And I want to pose quickly, so please be, be concise. We do have a question for Andrew from uh, Despina. And it's, uh, would it not still, uh, so it's an interesting point, would it not still stumble on the limits of that part of AI that is not explainable? And I think that uh, related to, you know, kind of holding these entities accountable and you might want to mention the aspects of strict liability uh, in the U.S. context. Sure, uh, I, I do think that it certainly touches upon the strict liability aspect of it, but it, it also perhaps touches upon the products liability aspect of things. And that was one of the, the parts that I had considered in adopting uh, the working proposal. But one of the limits that it comes into when you consider applying AI liability in a products liability uh, situation 
is the the case law of products liability essentially uh, requires a demonstration of using a reasonable alternative. And so in, in advanced AI situations, you're going to have uh, situations in, in which perhaps it's inexplicable why AI conducted a particular action, at least as far as a, you know, a human adjudicating the AI, or perhaps uh, it would simply become way too uh, uh, verbose to go through a situation like that in a litigation context. So explainability is certainly uh, very difficult, especially for a sufficiently advanced AI. Uh, and that's why strict liability kind of as a, a, a necessary container uh, I think works perhaps better as a way of having the legal certainty that will assign liability to a human person with meaningful human control over the AI, regardless of the explainability factor. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Andrew. And we have a quick one for TMA, an excellent one uh, from Walter Stover. Uh, does the attempt to make a non-biased algorithmic sentencing system by training it on a database that itself may reflect bias against certain individuals, in other words, by training it on pre on, on all the prior sentencing, um, uh, you know, um, itself, you know, isn't that bad, basically. Uh, and so, like, uh, you know, what what do you think um, about that? And can you think of any alternatives? Yeah. So, one hundred percent, that is a concern with um, training algorithmic sentencing. But I think that so th there's an article in the Atlantic that talked about how judges, when they were able to look at um, spreadsheets that showed since prior sentencing decisions, they were on a whole able to have more, uh, more objective decision making. And so I think that when we're training an, like an algorithmic sentencing, uh, a sentencing algorithm, if we're able to have humans do uh, reflect on what, you know, how objective each decision is and have those decisions reviewed and that, that data pruned, I think over time we can reduce a lot of the biases that we see inherent in a lot of the data sets that are being used to um, code these programs. What do you think, Daza? Oh. Oh, Daza's on mute. But... I'm sorry. Um, so super quick. Thank you, TMA. Um, yeah. And uh, so we're going to send you an email today um, with um, everything you need to know. Uh, about what happened and what's going to happen. But I want to highlight, um, go ahead and join the Telegram channel if, if you can. We'll send a link to it. Office hours are turning out to be great if you're free on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And contact Brian. I mean, one of the biggest wells of potential um, value from this class is doing experiential learning. Brian has selflessly volunteered to actually mentor and organize projects. Take him up on that if, if you haven't signed up yet. You can do a paper, a prototype, um, right, uh, other stuff. Um, and so uh, well, I'll send that link again too. It's not, it, right, it's not too late or is it too late now, Brian? No, it's, it's not, not too, too late. late. Um, I, I would say, uh, you know, fill out the form that you're interested in submitting a project. Um, we've already had a few submissions. I'm planning to get through those submissions this this week and get feedback to everybody. Uh, the only kind of hard deadline I would say is if you want to submit a project, submit it before the next class period. And then during uh, the period between mm -hmm. class three and class four, we are going to request that students submit a final project. Um, and final projects for the scope of this course is different than final projects for maybe where you want to wind up. So last year we had some final projects that took the form of, you know, a Google slide presentation or, you know, just a pitch and wound up becoming fully fledged papers that we published in the computational law report later on. So I would encourage everybody to kind of find, you know, a way to get something down that sort of represents the kernel of the idea that you're interested in. And then from there, we can go into and work together to find a way to get that to whatever the final place for it should be. Indeed, yes. Yeah. So in a sense, it's the final start <laughs> of a project if you want to continue it. Uh, TMA, uh, could you bring us home? <laughs> okay, guys, this wraps up our second class for this year's computational law report. Um, and like last time, if you have any questions, please email us, fill out the Google form or message us in Telegram. Okay, we'll see you guys next week. Great. Thank you. Bye, take care.